Hello, good evening. Thank you very much for coming tonight. My name is uh, Olivier Richon. I convene a research group here uh, called Documents. And last year, actually, uh, Tom participated uh, very regularly to this group. Uh, we studied the document sideways, as it were, looking at uh, the lower side of the document, at the side that Bataille refers to as a base materialism. However, I don't know how low we'll get today, but, uh, but it's very good uh, that Tom is, is able to participate uh, tonight. I'm very pleased with that. I guess I don't really need to remind you uh, of the publications of uh, Tom McCarthy, but I shall. Uh, I shall tell you that he is the author of Remainder in 2005, an amazing book that you should all have read or will read soon, of uh, his second novel, C, and as well, Satin Island, in 2015. He's also, that's lesser known, I think, the author of Tintin and the Secret of Literature. And it reminds me that in The Secret of Literature, there is uh, also uh, the companion of Tintin, Captain Haddock, who, strangely enough, each time Captain Haddock uh, has a fit, he tends to throw words and some words are words from rhetoric, like anakoluthan. So he seems very angry, he says, anakoluthan to a bunch of people. And anakoluthan is a very interesting figure because uh, it's a figure that uh, 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 attempts to rupture the sentence, to take liberties with logic and syntax. So in a sense, uh, yes, in Tintin there is a secret of rhetoric as well, I think. And another aspect that uh, you have to know about Tom McCarthy is that he's the General Secretary of the International Necronautical Society since 1999. Once uh, Tom gave a, an introduction to a publication uh, our students did a few years ago, and he had this amazing quote that I'm going to repeat tonight. It goes like that. Well, almost any photo, photoist worth any chemicals will tip anyone asking him the teaser that if a negative of a horse happens to melt enough while drying, well, what you do get is, well, a positively grotesquely distorted macromass of all sorts of horse happy values and masses of melt while horse tip. Tom says, so writes James Joyce in Finnegan's Wake. For all the verbal acrobatics going on here, all the neologisms, the tempo, animo, thermo pilings up, or collages being massed and mashed, the word that stands out for me most, the instrumental word on which this passage hinges, is simply negative. So please welcome Tom, and I'll be in conversation with him later. Great. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Olivier. And uh, can you hear me OK? It's very, very good to be here. I have very fond memories of being um, a, a visiting professor or lecturer or whatever I was at the Royal College. It's really good to be back. I do think you should change the name of this building, though, really. It should be called the Europa Building. Good, 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 good. I think if the purveyors of... Um, opioid misery don't deserve to have buildings named after them, then neither do supporters of fascism. But nonetheless, it is really, really good to be here. And, uh, and um, thank you. <laughs> it's really good to be here. Um, so, um, yes, last year I took part in this wonderful um, documents or document research seminar that, 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 that Olivier convened, and uh, uh, along with Jeremy Miller, I was occasionally invited in, and it was, it was hugely, I'd, I'm, I'm sure I'd, I learned more than I taught or whatever. Um, the title, Olivier's title, was, was clearly a, a nod to the, to the document group, Bataille, Lachis, Kaiwa, and so on. And it was also a kind of general springboard just for looking at the notion of documentation in general. And one, one, one thing that we briefly kind of glimpsed at in that context was Antonioni's 1966 film, Blow Up, 
And so I'd like to take this evening as an opportunity to unpack this fantastically rich artwork a little more, um, still as befits the film's bottomless, abyssal vertigo in a kind of telegraphic, incomplete, unscripted way. Perhaps this too will be just a springboard for us to begin talking more. So, um, so it's a film it's a film about a document. It's a film about the production of a document, about the reproduction of a document, and about the interpretation of a document. And, um, you know, even before we get to, I'm presuming most people here have, have seen it, but we'll, we'll look at a few bits of it just to refresh our memory. But, you know, as you probably know, the central event in this is, is uh, a photograph that is developed and, and enlarged, blown up. But that doesn't happen until about an hour in, even before, right from the beginning of the film, um, the film kind of announces itself as being about documentation, right? It, it shows 24 hours in the life of this guy, Thomas, who is a successful photographer, who's making a book-length photographic uh, do documentary, a documentary photographic portrait of a, of a changing London, under, you know, um, changing post-war 60s London. He's going undercover in DOS houses, he's snapping photos in clubs and parties, fashion shoots, and so on and so on. So it's a kind of, you know, the film is like this wide lens view of a city and a society in transit. And it's a film about an attempt to produce a wide lens view of a city and a society in transit. It's a kind of boxed document about the production of a document, which is focused through the more narrow lens view of this view's documenter, i.e. Thomas, who runs around documenting. Right? So in the morning of the day when the film begins, and it really is, it's, you know, it's a kind of classical Greek 24-hour time slot. In the morning of the day, um, while He's been looking um, unsuccessfully for old landscape paintings in a kind of dying antique shop that he wants to buy for his own future-facing, expanding business enterprise. While doing this, he stumbles across the entrance to a park. It's Marion Park in Shelton, but it, it doesn't matter. He stumbles across the entrance to a park, and he runs in. He runs around this real-world landscape, just generally snapping stuff. He makes, he, he, he kind of stomps among these pigeons and makes them take off so that he can photograph them, hold on to that double move. And then he sees this couple in the park, uh, a young woman and an older man, and they're engaged in this kind of choreographed flirtation, this kind of lover's play that seems very balletic almost, but something's not right about it. They keep, you know, they're moving, then they kind of stop, the mechanics of the choreography kind of keep jolting to a stop and then restarting and jolting to a stop again. There's a general mood of anxiety. The woman's looking out of the frame as though, you know, trying to take a visual cue from somewhere beyond, beyond the, um, the visible. And Thomas, the photographer, snaps this. He, he, he takes lots of photographs of them. The woman sees him. She runs after him. She tries to snatch the camera off him unsuccessfully. Later she comes to his studio, she offers him her body in exchange for the undeveloped film. She tries to steal the role of film, but he kind of foils her. Um, and, and he develops it, of course. As soon as she's gone, he develops the film. And looking at the contacts, he follows the eyeline of this woman in the photograph to a blurry section of the bushes. And he marks that bit on the on the print, he enlarges it, blows it up, and eventually he sees, of course, the gun that's pointing out of the bushes. Um, you've probably all seen this, but let's just watch about a minute and a half of this. This is the vital kind of sequence. No. Sorry, the time codes are all different. Okay, we're going to go from here instead. Excuse me, the time codes are different on this one. Okay.
gun. That's the kind of vital, the moment of realization. Later, he, he, he blows up the bit of the bushes and he, he sees the body, the body of the man who's been, who's been lured into the park and shot. He then goes to the park at night without his camera, uncharacteristically, and he finds the actual body. When he comes back, his films have all been stolen. He goes to the park again the next day to photograph the body, at which point there is no body, the body is gone. In fact, it's unclear whether it was, at this point in the film, the whole kind of reality field breaks down and it's unclear whether, it's unclear what we've been watching. It's unclear if there even ever was a body in the first place. Everything just starts kind of blurring, going out of focus in a haze of paranoia and drugs and the amoral drift of 60s London. So that's Antonioni's film. It was based on as you probably know, on um, a 1959 short story by Julio Cortazar, the Argentinian novelist, called The Devil's Drool, which interestingly itself was kind of, you know, it was an, a relatively obscure little short story that itself underwent a massive blowing up in, in import after the movie, so much so that it was republished with the new title, Blow Up. Um, <laughs> To, to kind of cash in on its on its on the movie's success, um, the story is absolutely brilliant. It's very short, and I and I really recommend you to read it. It's it's as good as the film. Unusually, usually, yeah, usually if the film's good, the book's not, and vice versa. But the, the, I think I think it's an amazingly good story, and um, and the setup in the in the story is that Roberto Michel, who is a Chilean French translator, he's a writer, he's a translator. He's also an amateur photographer. So on Sunday, when it's his kind of day off, he wanders around Paris with his camera. He goes to the Ile Saint-Louis, he goes to the Quai de Bourbon, and he sees the scene. But in this scene, there's the, it's the woman who's older. She's, I mean, she's not that old. She's in her 20s, 30s. But she's flirting in a similarly kind of choreographed way with this 14-ish year old boy she's kind of seducing this much younger boy and there's a man off to the side in a car and uh michelle snaps as in the film they get angry um the man comes out of the car as well and he turns out to somehow be part of it part of this situation the the boy sneaks off and the Michelle, the photographer, the man, and the woman are in this triangle kind of confronting each other. They demand the film. He doesn't give it. He goes back and photograph uh, and, and develops it just as in the, in the movie. And it's only when he develops it days later that he realizes what he's actually seen. The woman, it wasn't the woman that, well, the woman was not seducing the boy for herself. She was just the lure. She was the lure for the man. It's a deeply homophobic story. It's, it's based on the premise that the, the homosexual seduction of a 14-year-old is infinitely worse than the heterosexual seduction of a 14-year-old. Of, of a but that's, you know, that's the setup. He realizes that um, this is what he's seen, uh, 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 an attempted corruption of a, of a young boy by this sinister man in a, in a car using a woman as a, as a go-between, as a lure, and that he, Michel, by, by photographing it, has interrupted it. He thinks initially, as does Thomas in the film, that he's actually stopped the seduction murder taking place, but as the more he watches the photo, he, it starts, he, he starts realizing that actually he hasn't stopped it. By photographing it, he's allowed it to happen, to be forever happening. It will always eternally be happening. So he becomes kind of complicit in this horror and he has a complete mental breakdown. Now, okay, I think the fact that he's, there's two really important things. I think the fact that he's a translator is important because 
he's he, uh, he's translating obviously he's translating literature actually he's translating legal documents into French from Spanish but there's also a translation between media the book for the camera right I mean you could see the camera as a, as a machine for translating the world just like the book but there's a kind of implicit translation going on between you know dialogue between these two media forms writing and and photography um, or a triangle if you like and also the, what he is translating is significance it's not it, it, it's politics it's a it's a political legal tract on jurisprudence and justice challenges and appeals its author is actually called Allende which is a name that obviously in Chilean politics will become very important a decade or so later so all these things are kind of translating other things that's the point I want to make and something else is always at stake something outside of the frame of whichever translation machine we're kind of occupying at any moment and this is the other thing that I think is important the idea of the machine machines in the very first paragraph he uses the machine he uses the word machine in the first paragraph of the short story about five or six times he says I use the machine of his Remington typewriter I use the machine and then he says here is the of his camera he says here is the aperture which must be counted also as a machine of another sort a contacts 1.1.2 the car is of course a machine um, there's a sense as with Greek tragedy of being kind of caught up in some massive machinery of events right and the machinery of events is rendered here synecdocally as a literal machinery or literal machines the camera the typewriter the car now the film starts also with um, a machine with the arrival of a car in the city of London um, and the car is carrying all these mime artists Oh, why did it stop? So this is the opening scene of the whole film. I think it's very symbolic. It's, it's announcing the arrival of the spectacle machine, right? This is like Hamlet, when the players come to town. I mean, this is exactly the same. The players are in town. They're, they're mimes. They're, they're mime artists. And I think, you know, a, a kind of implicit subtext running through the whole film is that London life is one massive spectacle in the kind of de Bordian sense, right? It's just parties, fashion shoots, concerts, and so on. And Thomas, the protagonist, is not just its documenter, but he's also its producer, right? He orchestrates things. He, he moves stuff around. This is why I pointed out the pigeons. What he does with the pigeons is what he's doing with people, too, the whole way through. Um, there's, a, there's a remarkable scene where he shoots all these models, and he's really, he's, he's very aggressively saying, move this way, move that way, snap, snap, snap. So this is kind of feedback. I'm going to show you this scene. It's a kind of feedback loop of, of production and documentation of, of spectacle, of the mime. Here we go. Yeah? Doesn't want to play.
And he goes out and has a beer. He, he's a real asshole. This is, I mean, it's, it's kind of, it's, it must be, <laughs> it must be, uh, it's an interesting aspect of the film. Um, he puts them in a trance. He makes them close their eyes, having orchestrated this spect spectacle in a kind of military way. He's like a drill sergeant. He makes them close their eyes. He puts them in a trance. And, and I want to draw a kind of a parallel here with another document that we looked in during this document research group, which is an extraordinary film by, by Jean Ruche um, called Les Maîtres Fous, where he, um, he documents or he gets these, these Nigerians to perform for him. It's, it's unclear how much he's directing them and how much he's simply documenting something that's already taking place. He, he documents a ritual that they have where they reenact the military parades of the British, their colonial oppressors, in, in, a, in a completely trance-like form. Um, it's a it remains a very controversial film. On the one hand, it's, it's seen as a kind of rather racist, exoticizing of, uh, of a kind of imagined savagery. On the other hand, uh, it's seen, you know, conversely, it's, it's often viewed as a, as a great subversive um, anti-colonial critique. The, the, the notion that the Africans are somehow, through this reenactment, stealing, stealing the magic, um, or at the very least, parodying the, the, the spectacle. There's, I'll just play a few, a few little bits. Porte sur leur casque, car le voilà le véritable gouverneur. Au tropique de Colors, de l'ouverture de l'Assemblée à Accra. Hamilton est dans cette foule, il y a les Hamilton, ils sont venus ici pour chercher leur modèle. Et si l'ordre est différent, ici et là, le protocole est bien net. You get the idea. Whichever way we we take this, I think I think it's clear that that what's going on in in both the scenes I've just shown you is 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 a, a, a tying of power to spectacle um, and to trance, to a kind of state of, yeah, of being entranced. Um, and the role of the anthropologist is, is, is kind of significant here. I and mean, we could see, you know, Antonioni, of course, is an Italian looking at London. Michel in the, in the short story is a Chilean looking at France. It's a, it's a foreign eye on a, on, a, on a native culture. And it's not just looking at it, you know, it's prompting, perhaps even orchestrating the spectacle, which is then documented, this kind of feedback loop. There's a, there's a well-known phenomenon in uh, anthropology, which most anthropologists see as a real problem, called the Hawthorne effect, uh, that was first discovered by an anthropologist called Landsberger, whereby the group that you're observing know that they're being observed and will act a particular way um, you know, which, which is a problem because you want them to act normally, but they're acting you know, because you're watching them, like, 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 like the cat being alive or dead in Schrodinger's box when the scientist, when the scientist um, looks. It's, there's a similar uh, syndrome in psychoanalysis, actually, where the patient will enact certain versions of the pathology that he or she knows the doctor, the, the, the analyst, wants them to. So this, this, this similar kind of psychoanalysis is also about kind of trance-like states um, in, its, in its history. So I'm, I'm, I'm interested in this, yeah, this relation of power, observation, spectacle, feedback, trance. Um, 
We could call it mimicry or charade. And in this respect, the mime players, who, who we might consider a kind of marginal leitmotif, they just pop up twice in the film. But actually, I think they're absolutely central to the whole film because they embody its core logic. And the film, in other words, they embody its core logic of mimicry and spectacle. And the film comes back to them at the very end. I'll play the last two or so minutes of the film. Um, Close your eyes. After, after Thomas has, has failed to... Um, failed to find the body, he goes lower in the park, and lo and behold, here are these guys playing a, a mimed game of tennis without a ball. I'll stop it there. I'll come back to it in a set. But I think this is very, this is very significant, right? Tennis without a ball is basically it's the machine without its content, right? And it makes me wonder: is this entire film a kind of like the Nigerian ceremony, a kind of parodic reenactment, um, whose whose intent would be to kind of void the imperial seat, you know, London, British, and by extension Western society of its metaphysical content. I think there's certainly, as with the African ritual, there's the, the, there's the whole um, question being played out in it about the sacred and desacralization, right? Again, involving machinery and the running down of machinery. There's one, there's one other scene I want to show you. So the time codes are annoyingly different on this. He goes to a club, he goes to a rock club, a rock concert. Here we go. And, um, and the machine breaks. We'll, we'll run it from here. throws it away. It's useless. Uh, this is a fantastic little little episode here. Um, 
the fetish, the fetish object of the car. I mean, this really is a sacred object at the point where, where, the, where the musician throws it into uh, the audience. And within 30 seconds, it's just become a piece of trash, a meaningless piece of detritus in the street. And I, I cannot but help think, King, when I see that, of, of the work of, of Ian Forsyth and Jane Pollard, um, two projects of theirs that you probably know. One is File Under Sacred Music, in which they had a reenactment of a cramps gig from the 70s, an exact reenactment. The original was done in the Napa Mental Health Institute and in the ICA when Ian and Jane redid it, they did it with uh, mental health system users. Um, and a similar kind of, I was there, there was a remarkable kind of frenzy. I mean, I, it's just, I'll just show you a few seconds to get a taste of it. The point is, it, again, it was a kind of this, this, I mean, it was called File Under Sacred Music. It was this kind of ritual that, that worked itself up to a massive frenzy. And then it kind of stops and everyone goes, oh, yeah, whatever. That was just a piece of art reenactment. Yep, OK. <laughs> so this kind of sliding up and down. Another of, of Ian and Jane's projects they'd done before that was also a reenactment of the last, of, of the famous uh, last ever Ziggy Stardust concert, where again at the ICA they 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 had they had the exact film, the famous film of that concert reenacted in all its details. Fascinating, they said afterwards people were fighting, people in the audience were fighting over the plectrum and scraps of the playlist um, that the Bowie reenactor had used, and sobbing as they as they held you know scraps of clothing and so on, which I think is really important because the issue of Authenticity is kind of irrelevant. It doesn't matter whether it's real or not. What matters is its proximity to the sacred, to, 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 this, to this zone of the sacred, which is only entered through reenactment, not through authenticity, but through mimicry, through, through simulation. It's a kind of, um, it's a kind of, uh, we could call it, it's about a symbolic proximity to the sacred heart of the ritual, even if that heart is dysfunctional or machinic, right? What matters is the machinery. Even if the machinery doesn't even work, it kind of breaks, it still functions. Even if it doesn't function, it still functions. Like an amp, it can kind of dial the sacred up, down, in, out completely. But the kind of the sacred, the Holy Ghost, is always in the machinery. It's always at stake, living and dying fading in and out. So, yeah, fading in and out. I want to talk about camouflage a bit, fading in and out in a kind of visual sense, because in the movie, you know, as we saw, the event, the murder, is quite literally camouflaged in foliage. The gun is in the foliage. It is camouflaged. And another, to me, very obvious kind of link to contemporary art to make would be to the work of forensic architecture. It seems to me, in fact, that blow up could be seen to contain the entire project of forensic architecture in embryo. It's as though AL and, and, and co watched that film and parlayed it up into a, into a brilliant 10-year um, you know, ten year, ten year plan. I, I, I'm presuming you all know about their work, but they also look at pixelated landscapes and try and draw out the um, the murder, the murderous, uh, this, usually the, the state violence lurking behind the um, blurred satellite pixelated imagery, you know, the gun in the foliage, as it were, on a kind of global political stage rather than just in a local park. But the, the gesture is, is the same. They have this wonderful phrase, the threshold of detectability. Every event has a threshold of detectability. And the whole thing is to, through Techne through aesthetics. Aesthetics for Aristotle just means what we can sense and how we can sense it. I think the work of forensic architecture is aesthetics par excellence. It's totally political. Aesthetics is always political. Um, because it's about, you know, getting beneath the threshold of detectability or, or enlarging it, blowing, blowing it up. Um, 
bringing uh, another point that 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 Eyal Weissman always makes is is the he discusses the etymology of the word forensics and says it's from the Latin forum. Forensics is bringing the hidden event into public space, into the forum, naming it, making it visible. So. Document, documentation then would be an act. It would, documentation would serve as a testimony machine. It's a machine for producing testimony. So it seems to me that all of this, if we're looking for a kind of big philosophical category to kind of an umbrella to put all this under, this, the, the, the obvious candidate would be the, this Baduan notion of you know, the event, live animal, right? So if blow up is a kind of blueprint for forensic architecture, then a blueprint for this film, I think, would be perhaps Bruegel's uh, famous painting of Icarus, where you don't really see Icarus unless, you unless you're told it's there. You don't even see the little legs disappearing into the water. It's just, it's a tiny detail, kind of camouflaged by everything else. And Auden famously writes this poem, Musée de Beaux-Arts, about this painting, and he says that the monumental event, any monumental event, takes place while someone else is eating or opening a window or just walking dully along. That even the dreadful martyrdom must run its course anyhow in a corner, some untidy spot where the dogs go on with their doggy life. How everything turns away quite leisurely from the disaster. The plowman may have heard the splash, the forsaken cry, but for him it was not an important failure. The sun shone as it had to on the white legs disappearing into the green water and the expensive delicate ship that must have seen something amazing, a boy falling out of the sky, had somewhere to get to and sailed calmly on. Right? So, for Badiou, the great modern thinker of the event, the event is also, as for Auden, as for Bruegel, characterised by a kind of being beside itself. He talks about, in, in being and event, he talks about sight points within, within an eventual situation that teeter on the edge of the void, right? They're always pointing to what cannot be played out within their set. He writes, the paradox of the eventual sight is that it can only be recognized on the basis of what it does not present in the situation in which it is presented. And at the heart of that book, he turns to Mallarmé, and particularly to Un Un Coup de Day, the, this huge, expanded, blown-up poem that, that is characterized by huge expanses of white space, of, of paper without words in it, the blank space in which the catastrophe is not so much the event of the shipwreck that the poem kind of narrates, but it's not so much that as its disappearance. The catastrophe is the disappearance of the catastrophe, the voiding of the representational field. Mallarmé writes, nothing will have taken place except the place. That could almost be the subtitle for that wonderful shot of the empty park, you know, in, when, there's, when there's no one in it in the final photo. And we might also think of Blanchot and, and his wonderful very short book, The Writing of the Disaster, in which he defines the disaster. Well, he doesn't define the disaster. He says the disaster, the event, is neither noun or verb, but a remainder which would bar with invisibility and illegibility all that shows and is said. So it's kind of exhaustive and exhausting, the event, but itself is inexhaustible or even unsayable. Blanchot writes, when everything has been said, what remains to be said is the disaster. And interestingly, Michel, I wonder if um, Cortazar had read, had read Blanchot because his Michel uses almost the exact, well, he uses the exact same rhetorical framework, but a little bit differently. He says, he writes, what remains to be said is always a cloud, two clouds, or long aisles of a sky perfectly clear, a very clean, clear rectangle tacked up with pins on the wall of my room. In other words, what remains to be said when all has been said is the photograph itself, the scene or non-scene of the disaster. For Blanchot, the disaster causes a kind of fragmenting of time. Blanchot writes, we are on the edge of the disaster without being able to situate it in the future. It is rather always already past, and yet we are on the edge or under the threat. All formulations which would imply the future, that which is yet to come, if the disaster were not that which does not come, that which has put a stop 
to every arrival. He continues to think the disaster, if this is possible, and it's not possible, in as much as we suspect that the disaster is thought. To think the disaster is to have no longer any future in which to think it. I'm sure Cortésar has read Blanchot because because Michel is, this is exactly his situation. For him as well, temporality is completely fractured when he blows up the photograph. At that point, he writes, I understood if that was to understand what had to happen now, what had to have happened then, what would have to happen at that moment. What happens in the middle of what I'm writing is coming already. And then he just says, now, the word now is a dumb lie. He, so he ends up psychotic. He ends up frozen in time, or rather frozen or, or trapped in this kind of scrambled overlay of temporalities, of times, exactly what Blanchot calls non-contemporaneity, a passage already passed over, the passive which outside time disarranges time as pure and empty form wherein all would order and distribute itself either equally or unequally. One further philosopher has to be mentioned here, Levinas, Emmanuel Levinas, right? Great thinker of ethics. He also has a totally machinic understanding of event fields. In, um, in, in, in this essay, well, it's a transcript of an interview, actually. is ontology fundamental. He's being interviewed by Radio France Culture. And the interviewer starts by asking him, how does one begin thinking? And Levinas responds, we exist in a circuit of understanding with reality. We have one finger caught in the machine. And then he says, Ethics begins, sorry, thinking begins with trauma, right? It probably begins, he says, through traumatisms or gropings to which one does not even know how to give a verbal form, a separation, a violent scene, a sudden consciousness of the monotony of time. And time is very important in Levinas's thought as well. Trauma for him clefts time into it, interrupts order. It brings up a trace of surprised forgettings, right? So through trauma, what he calls the synchronizing tendencies of rationalist and humanist thinking are replaced by what he calls the supreme anachronism or the diachronic ambivalence that makes ethics possible. Right? It opens up the field of ethics. Why? Because in this diachronic space, in this space of temporal overlay, the other is allowed in. It's, it, it breaks open the gap through which the other enters, and the other demands acknowledgement. The traumatism of the other demands the act of bearing witness. Not so much to a particular event or a particular person as to a kind of bottomless, infinite demand of otherness. Temporally, he calls this infinity. This is infinity. It's infinity that enters through the diachronic encounter with the other. And the demand of this infinity requires an act of witnessing, of bearing witness, right? Witnessing is a vital concept for, for Levinas, who is a Holocaust survivor. It's not, not irrelevant. Now, of course, um, both Michel in the novella and in the story and, 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 and Thomas in the film are witnesses, obviously. They are, they are witnesses. And they are both unable to bring their testimony to the forum in any complete or rational way. They are unable to kind of place it within time, place it within a kind of juridico-politico-legal formal discourse or framework. But I would argue that this is com precisely consistent with the ethics of the event, as Levinas understands it, which doesn't fit a rational schema, right? The other can neither explain himself nor be explained by the thinking subject. The only response to the other, to this encounter with infinity, is a kind of abject surrender, a surrender to infinity. Blanchot, drawing on Levinas, frames this as repetition, right? He says, let us remember repetition, non-religious repetition, it's like a Marky Smith song. Non-religious repetition, neither mournful, mournful nor nostalgic. The undesired return, repetition, the ultimate over and over 
general collapse, destruction of the present. So this non-religious, eternal, jolting reiteration like a shuddering machine, this is exactly the type of repetition that both Thomas in the, in the film and Michelle in the, in the book get locked into. Both Thomas and Michelle merge into this shuddering machinery. I just want to return to that final scene in the film because there's a vital sound decision, sound editing decision that is made in this final game of chess. Here we go, let's do our chess, um, tennis, here we go. Okay, he throws the ball back. He, he, he kind of is incorporated into the mimicry machine. But then li listen to this. He's hearing the thwop. And the final gesture is into the grass, right? He, he, this complete camouflage, complete mimicry. He disappears into the grass. Michel, at the end of the short story, also disappears. He disappears into the cloud, into the sky of the photograph. He, he says, I, I, am, I am the sky, I am the cloud, prisoner of another time, untellable time, prisoner of the photo, right? This is camouflage to the point of complete psychosis. Um, so the final, I'm going to stop in a sec and chat, chat with Olivier, but the final framework, the final kind of figure I want to bring in to help us think about this film and this story is, um, is, is the work of a member who was actually in the original document group, Roger Kaiwa, who's, who's, um, who I should have a, here we go. This is a PDF of, uh, I mean, you don't need to read it. I'm really showing you it for the pictures. Um, it's, it's a PDF of, of, his, of his essay, Mimicry and Legendary Psychasthenia, which is illustrated with all these pictures of this is a praying mantis. Oh, uh, this is a praying mantis devouring her mate. And these are, um, in, uh, sorry, plant mimicking insects, insects that, camouflage themselves by, by taking on the shape of the, of the plant. Kaiwa calls this legendary psychasthenia. Um, for him, legendary psychasthenia is all about yeah, mimicry um, and, and prey. It's, it's how insects simulate plants in order to, and, and lure sexual, sexual partners whom they then kill and devour, which is completely the world of blow up, right? Um, Vanessa Redgrave, the, the, the actress and the, and the blonde woman who's never named in the, in the story are basically praying mantises. They, they, lure the, they lure the victim in sexually so that they can be murdered or, or um, corrupted. Um, and, and, you, and, and there are innumerable shots in the film of Thomas behind plants, behind feathers. It's not just the gun that's camouflaged. He's the kind of double of the gun. He's always hiding. He's always in trees. He's always merging with kind of trunks of trees, just like these insects. 
mating rituals, uh, death rituals. Death comes literally from the camouflage in the film. Now, Kaiwa fascinatingly ties this morphological mimicry to a particular mechanical medium, which is photography, right? He writes, Morph this is a quote, morphological mimicry could be, after the fashion of chromatic mimicry, mimicry, an actual photography, but of the form and the relief, a photography on the level of the object and not on that of the image, a reproduction in three-dimensional space with solids and voids, sculpture photography, or better, teleplasty, if one strips the word of any metaphysical content, right? So it's not like a photograph, it is a photograph. It's a teleplastic, 3D, haptic, actual photograph. The insect becomes the photographic chromatic image of the object they're hiding against. Kaiwa calls this magic in the anthropological sense. It's denuded of any actual metaphysics. He calls it magic in the anthropological sense, fascination in the kind of Blanchodian sense, and above all, in, the, in a Malamean sense, we could say he calls it a temptation by space, right? Legendary psychasthenia is above all a disturbance, as he puts it, a disturbance in the relations between personality and space. And he cites the typical answer of the schizophrenic patient to the question, where are you? And this is a, this is a brilliant quote. He says, the typical answer of the schizophrenic patient to the question, where are you, is, I know where I am, but I do not feel as though I'm at the spot where I find myself. To these dispossessed souls, Kaiwa continues, to these dispossessed souls, souls, space seems to be a devouring force. Space pursues them, encircles them, digests them in a gigantic phagocytosis. It ends by replacing them. Then the body separates itself from thought, the individual breaks the boundary of his skin and occupies the other side of his senses. He tries to look at himself from any point whatever in space. He feels himself becoming space, dark space where things cannot be put. He is similar, not similar to something, but just similar and he invents spaces of which he is the convulsive possession." Unquote. Well, this is an exact description of the fate of Thomas and Michelle. They are eaten by space through mimicry, through an act of teleplastophagocytosis or cyanotosis. They undergo legendary psychasthenia, right? Psych Asthenia, again, from aesthetics. Through this machinic and utterly non-mystical, but for that no less total Eucharist, they enter the awful kind of inescapable interregnum, or to give it another word, infinity. Okay, And this infinity, this interregnum through which they're devoured, is precisely the time and space not just of aesthetics, but of ethics. Right? Both characters are subject. This is why it's interesting that despite his being a complete jerk, Thomas is actually a totally ethical subject in the Levinasian sense, right? Both characters are subject traumatically, passively, and unheroically, but irremediably to this interstice, this gap, this void, this non-space of translation, automatism, photography, psychosis, whose content will forever remain untranslatable. This, I'd say, is the core mode and the core stake of the document, properly understood, as Antonioni and Cortazar clearly do. And if we too start to understand this, that we'll, we'll see that it's the document's event space, even if it's a non-event space, might well be the most important event space of all. But I'll stop there. That's all I have to say. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I really uh, appreciated the way you moved from the novel to the film and then
from the novel, the film, and uh, Kaiwa. And finally enough, we ended up with a sense of uh, visual cannibalism, mm -hmm. it seems to me. And perhaps, perhaps it's a way to start the discussion, in a way, from the end. Uh, from, for instance, this picture of the owl that yeah. disappears uh, into... It's true, this one's not an insect, it's an owl. Yeah, yeah and in a sense, the owl is a predator, so it's different. The owl doesn't yeah. hide to protect itself, but hides to hunt. Yeah, like uh, the gun. So in a sense, perhaps the, the owl is more like the photographer, in a certain sense. Or the murderer. There's, a, the there's murder. a doubling, yeah. yeah. Uh, I think maybe it made me, it reminded me as well that another author uh, who, who is interested in this uh, relationship to space, in this sort of inversion, is uh, Jean Baudrillard. Yeah. Uh, not fashionable anymore, although he used to be for his uh, theory of uh, simulacrum. But however, uh, he was a keen amateur photographer, a bit like the hero in the novel. Uh, and because he, he really couldn't care less about his photography as a you know, artistic practice, or as a practice, but purely as a, what he calls a ludic practice, a practice of enjoyment, uh, he got to understand it quite well. And he had this odd theory that uh, actually it's not so much that we photograph things or that we photograph reality. It is more that it is photography that incorporates us. It is a reality that turns its eye upon us. So in a sense, the photographer becomes, is devoured by what she yeah. sees mm -hmm. very much in the case. Uh, but but it's, a, it's a convulsive uh, enjoyment in a way. And convulsion is a term from surrealism. Yeah, convulsive. It's beauty will be convulsive or not at all. Beauty right. will be convulsive or not at all. Uh, but uh, it's worth adding as well that another great theoretician of photography uh, is uh, Salvador Dali. Uh, for him, beauty would be edible or nothing at all. So again, one goes back to this, yeah. to, to it, this idea of incorporating the real or being incorporated by it. Um, yeah, we can make all kind of parallels with chemicals and digestive tracts and the, you know, the Polaroid that kind of shits out, you know, <laughs> the, 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 the yes. image. And yeah, yeah. Uh, <coughs> so in a sense, the photography is in a position of uh, vulnerability and not so much in a position of control uh, because of the cliché is to, in a way, place photography as a medium of control. Well, yeah. not, not the case, it's often true, it's not only a cliche, but uh, in, in the case of uh, the two protagonists in the novel and the film, they, they in a sense, they, they lose control, totally, yeah. upon, upon visibility, with an instrument that is supposed to control visibility. Yeah, think? Uh, absolutely. No, this is the, it's the, the, it's the, the vortex through which they, they, they disappear. Um, but I, I mean, I, th this is why I want to, wanted to kind of put forensic architecture in there because, you know, it, it's so quaint, this film in a way, the idea that the photographer is this guy that has a camera and goes out and photographs and is, I mean, we've all got an, uh, we've all got an iPhone, but even if we don't have iPhones, you know, we just walk down the street, we are being photographed by security cameras. We are being archived and recorded uh, just by having an iPhone in our pocket, you know, the black box in the Nevada desert has tracked where we've been. And I mean, every single moment of our transit through space is, is, you know, we're living inside a giant photograph, I guess, or a giant data, you know, translation machine. Everything is translated into, into, into some, some data point in this giant, giant kind of illegible, I mean, even to the NSA, I mean, they've got everything and even they can't read it. I mean, this is, this is Trevor Paglin's point in that wonderful image of the, of the black box in Maryland, the building size mausoleum of data. Right. So, so, and then what a group like Forensic Architecture, are, 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 I guess, are doing, are, are just looking at the question of, of citizenship and, and politics, I guess, within this, 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 this kind of all-devouring, um, you know, 
nth debord to the nth generation spectacular um, kind of kind of situation. You know, is it, is it just control or, or, or might it empower? You know, citizen journalism. I mean, most of the images that they work with are kind of things snapped on iPhones by just people in the street when a when a you know. A, 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 a bombing takes place or, 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 or something. I mean, there's, there's a kind of two-way movement of, of agency. I mean, it's, 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 um, there are democratic possibilities that open up as, as well as, you know, totalitarian ones, I think, within that space. But the point is that it, that media space has to be understood. And I think a film like this is a kind of, so it's like looking at an archaeology of the present moment. Um, yes, it is. But on the other hand, also, it's really predicated upon a response to an analog tool, just as the typewriter mm. is an analog way of writing, in a way. Don't you think? They're both machines, but they're machines that there's always a gap. So a photographer takes a picture, but the picture is not visible yet, uh, and the film can be stolen. So yeah. it, it's definitely an unstable image. Yeah, although I was reading recently that, that, that actually all our data storage of our snaps is actually causing more um, climate catastrophic effects than all the aeroplanes in, you know, right. in, 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 a, in a week in Heathrow. I mean, the, the, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, digital is not dematerialized. There are giant, giant servers using up electricity. There are underpaid laborers building the iPhones that we can have up, you know, in, in China or, or wherever. They're, they're, these are material practices. Um, yes, right. You know, they're, they're just hidden. I mean, that's the bit, that's, that's the, the act of violence, if you like, that, that's camouflaged out of the, out of the, the photo. Um, yes, it's a different materiality. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. The production of the image is perhaps even more invisible. Yes. Uh, in this respect. For sure. Yes. But what, what uh, you, you touched upon uh, this analogy between the typewriter and the camera, and it, it's done very well uh, in, 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 in the, the novel, the, yeah. because Roberto Michel seems to place his typewriter right in front of the image, yeah. uh, as if the typewriter takes the place of a camera, as it were. And, and when, he, when he runs out of steam on the translation, he, look, he works a bit more on the image, and then when the image stops giving him anything, he goes back to the, back to the typewriter. So, so again, it's, it's in the kind of translation between the, in the interstice between these two machines that the, the event jumps out at him. It's, it's not really from within one or from within the other. And of course, he's writing on his typewriter, we have to imagine. Yes, yes, you're right. So there are two apparatuses of translation, in a mm -hmm. way. But, but neither is complete in itself. It, it, it kind of needs, you know, uh, it needs the other of it as its whatever, objet petit a, you know, the kind of, the other is, is its lack. It's somewhere, but it's, you know, it's like this Malamé's idea of between, between these different forms that the, the work will, will emerge. It won't emerge from poetry or from dance or from music. It's going to be in, in this kind of movement between them. And I think there's exactly that kind of triangulation of, of, of media and, uh, that's going on in, in, in the story. I mean, more than the film. The film is really about photography. Yeah. Whereas I think the, the, the short story is very much about writing. Yeah. It's totally. Totally yeah. about writing. Yeah, yes. It, yeah. Yeah. Although I suppose that what the what one kind of dialectic in the or tension in the film is between the, the still image and the and the moving image. I mean it's a film about a still image. Um, it made me think lots of David yeah, Lynch's right. films, they revolve around the, there's always a photo at the heart of the film, there's a photograph that explains the film. Lost Highway, Mulholland Drive, or Wild at Heart. They always, in the middle of it, they stumble across a photograph that shows, the, you know, whatever mystery is, is at the heart of it. But, but formally, that's kind of interesting. You know, at, at the, the still image explains the moving image somehow. Or you think of that bit in La Jetée where the, the, one, the one bit of movement where the woman wakes up. I, I, I think, I wonder if Antonio is working around some similar kind of concerns. Yeah, although Thomas cannot keep still. Mm. He's obsessed with a still image, but he cannot keep still oh. himself. Yeah. Uh, 
I don't think he sleeps in the 24 hours that, that the film... He doesn't sleep. It's a sort of a weird uh, London flaneur. Yeah. He goes, at one point you see him kind of stretched out after he's, you know, had sex with these two women who he's maybe going to take a photograph of, and, and he doesn't take a photograph. They, they want to be photographed by him, and you kind of see him. It's this kind of trance-like, you know, trance is, is, a, is a good way of kind of understanding. Yeah, but he's constantly, constantly m moving. Yep. Yeah, and no, I, I think he smokes dope at the end as well, no? I think he, sh he goes to a big dope party, but yeah. he doesn't. I think he smokes dope with Vanessa Redgrave. I mean, yeah. Yeah, so it's a trance-like film. And unlike, unlike, <coughs> unlike the story, which is much more, I think, there's an obsession of all the possibilities that could arise from the encounter uh, between, these, between the boy, the woman, and the man in the car. Yeah, he imagines the seduction. He imagines the boy being taken. Well, he imagines two versions of the seduction. One will be going home with the woman, which will just be, because it's heterosexual, that will just be a normal rite of passage, loss of virginity. But then he imagines the, the sinister homosexual one, which will involve actually engravings and images. He thinks the man is going to show him images to seduce him, like in Proust, you know, look at my engravings, look at my photos pornographic photos so so this yeah there's this real help kind of he, he builds up the scene but in both uh, the the initial thought is that he's he's stopped the, the 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 disaster from taking place and then both realize that they've especially in the book that he's really he's making it take place he's somehow triggered it like Oedipus yeah. you know working out what's going on actually just causes it to happen even more you know you you you, you cause the predestined event to take place by by trying to stop it and a bit like in the film, it ends up with uh, this idea of the pigeons. Yes. The pigeons yeah, and the sparrows. The, the pigeons and the sparrows, they're, 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 very, they're very important. And I think that's probably why Antonioni has him stomp among the pigeons. But I, what interests me is that kind of that, that miniature feedback loop he's creating, which is kind of a mise en abeam of, of the whole film. You know, he makes the pigeons move so that he can photograph them. He's kind of prompting the... The, the, the thing in this, in this, you know, he's creating the choreography, which, which um, I guess in the book it's just more, he just becomes the pigeons, he becomes the sky in this utterly, um, yeah, psychotic way. Yeah. It's worth noting also that the, the story blow up was triggered by a photographer, a friend. I didn't know this. You told me this. It's really uh, interesting. A friend of uh, Cortázar, uh, which I think is interesting. So, a uh, Chilean photographer working in Paris and later on working for Magnum. So, maybe it's just so story, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> maybe it's an invention of a, of a writer, I have no idea. But it's a it's a interesting start. I think we should open it to the to the audience to discuss the questions of uh, mimicry and cannibalism or other things. We have two microphones about to be launched. So it's um, hard to talk about mimicry and ritual and violence without, without bringing in René Girard, no? Is there a reason to avoid him? I just haven't read hardly any René Girard. Oh. That's the only reason. Uh, <laughs> you want to say something? I could, no, I haven't. Uh, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm obsessed with Cavois because it's a direct relationship to photography. Maybe, maybe you could tell us what we've missed. It's just that... Um, you know, the idea, his, his idea is that in ritualizing violence, you're rendering it um, safe, essentially, that it, the, uh, the mimetic dimension here is combined with um, an insulation, a kind of sanitization of what would otherwise have a completely uncontrolled outlet. And perhaps one can think of um, photography, or more, more film, I imagine, as being a kind of mechanization of that violent ritual, except that now it becomes mechanical for free. You don't have to reenact it because the reenactment is there every time you press the play button. Um, 
perhaps not. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, yeah. I'm thinking. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> buffering. But I'm thinking uh, that the violence in uh, is very. Uh, uh, Kagwa really uh, explains uh, a sort of uh, masochistic violence of the insect, because the insect becomes like a leaf, invis is invisible to such an extent that another insect will begin to eat that insect, so that. Uh, in a sense, the insect is devoured by, by its own species. Yeah, he which points out. Yeah. the success of mimicry, but also. Yeah, it's uh, so good it doesn't. It's so good it doesn't work. Mm. I mean, it doesn't protect them because they just Not get eaten all. because they actually look like plants that are th that their own type want to eat. Yes. So, so it, w he says something else is at stake than self-preservation. It's about yeah, a, a, a temptation by space, a desire to become, to be digested. Um, in, in this kind of Eucharist of, of you know, of ph and he calls it photography as well. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Okay. Any more questions? <laughs> I'm not used to speaking a microphone. Uh, I wanted to, uh, I like the um, link you made between the film, photography, and translation, and writing, and uh, especially between, which is uh, the mode of photography and film. I wanted to ask you what you see in the use of the frozen picture. Because I think, you know, it's, it's very strong picture, this uh, woman, or all the, uh, all, all the images he's using mm. to uh, depict this, uh, this moment, which is uh, essential is in the movie. Mm. And what, how, how would you analyze the use of the frozen picture in a movie? Yeah. Was you understand what I mean? Uh, yeah. Li like, um, in the 400 blows, for instance, that's the last picture, that's a frozen picture. That may be the beginning of the career of Truffaut. <laughs> or you know what, that's, uh, how would you? Yeah. Yeah, I was just, what I mean, was this made before La Jetée? The freeze, oh, you say the frozen picture or the freeze? The, f the frozen, the freeze the frozen, frame. The freeze frame, yeah. yeah. Was this, was this film, when frame. was La Jetée made? 70s, early 70s? So this anti Chris Marker's La, La Jetée. La Jetée. 72. Is it 63? Yeah, yeah, okay, so <laughs> this is 66. So, I mean, cause But that's, that's the contrary, maybe. That's not the frozen picture. Well, it's all because frozen pictures that of, yeah, you know, that, no, but apart from one. And suddenly they move. Yeah. They get into life. That's another. 62. That, that's the <laughs> 62. Thank you, That's Google. maybe the, the other way round. Because they are old pictures, like a Roman photo, yeah. and then suddenly it becomes lively. Yeah. Which is a wonderful moment when she, she awakes. When she wakes in La Jetée. In La Jetée. But that's the other way around. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, well, that's why I thought of Lynch and the, you know, the, the still that explains the film, you know, the, the still. And, and of, you know, the idea of a road movie as well. Is, you know, but is it Truffaut? The, is it Weekend, where you've got all these cars, but they're stuck? Yeah. It is Weekend. Yeah, yeah so it there it's about movement and stasis. And, and, you know, it's where Baudrillard comes back in. He says, Dri you know, a car is, a, when you're in a car, the landscape becomes a film. I mean, it was already a film, but it re reveals itself as a movie when you're in this other machine. The car is like an aperture for watching the film of landscape through because you move through it. And this is the way that America was built to be watched. And then, you know, like in a film like Psycho, it kind of starts out as a road movie, basically. And then it just stops, just stops at this hotel and there's all these stuffed animals and she's murdered and... and you know, looking through the aperture. And I mean, it seems, I, I know, I think there's a, I, I, I think, yes, I think all of these things we're talking about are just parables of cinema. I know as a writer, all I ever actually write about is just writing. <laughs> and yeah. I, think, I, I think certainly 
this this is this is the kind of meditation about the medium itself that's going on in yeah no because I, I just wanted to know what is this the, the place of this frozen picture by you know the use of photography and maybe the connection between photography and moving the moving image you know that's because you 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 talked about uh, ethics and uh, aesthetics and mm. I didn't understand quite what you what you did mean with uh, the infiltration of ethics <laughs> through uh, mm. photography. Well, What's for Levinas, ethics happens when when the smooth machinery of temporal flow kind of mm. shudders and jolts, and if you like, two bits of the <laughs> another bit of the film starts getting doubled up and you know breaking through the time codes all go wrong or, or whatever that that's th this this asynchronic opening to other times and, and otherness happens um, in that in that moment and I, I I don't know I mean it's a really good question I, I don't know what the answer is I mean we should try and work yeah, it out together either. but I mean yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's uh, you know I, I think yes yeah, certainly that there, there there is a sense that the vital thing you have to stop the, the machinery has to judder to a halt in order, obviously, in order to see or, or be enlarged in order to see the gun. I mean, presumably, actually, in the film, where we, when we first saw the park, there was a gun in the bushes. We just didn't see it, right? It's only when the character in the film blows it up and blows it up that we see the gun that we have seen but not seen that we've seen, you know? So, um, yeah. yeah. I was still something you. about machinery and breaking machinery and, and then the eruption of something else only when the machinery breaks or, or yeah. Stops. Stops. Which is why I showed that clip from the rock club. I mean, it's when the machine doesn't quite work that the sacred moment kind of happens, which isn't sacred, but it kind of, it is. But you are presuming that there is a gun. And <laughs> doesn't it show us that photography is utterly useless as an evidence-based medium? Because as, a what, as a what medium? As an evidence-based medium. And it's all uh, conjecture at the end. Unless we go with the Walter Benjamin sense that um, every photograph depicts a crime scene. Yeah. I mean, this is, yeah. Sure, he, he sees that, I mean, this is where the film is so, you know, um, difficult to read in a straight out, I mean, it's not a detective film, I mean, it is, but then it just unravels because he sees the murder, he even goes and sees the body. And in fact, later, after he's seen the body, the only photo that's not stolen from his studio is behind the fridge, and it's of the body. And he says to this woman who's wandered in, he says, I've just seen a murder, there's the body. And he points to the photograph. I mean, the photograph is the body. But then later he goes and there is no body. And, and yeah, he might have just imagined the whole thing. And he hears the tennis balls that aren't there, I'm sure. But I think whether or not there was a murder in that film, Benjamin's still right. There is a crime in every image. You know, there is, there is a crime in every image. Um, and and in this, in the yeah, this is a political film. You know what what's what's going on in this film? Well, you know, maybe the crime is about London. And yeah, the yeah, yeah. Well, exactly. You see all these shots of all these documentary shots of housing projects being torn down. You know, gentrific. I mean, all the shit that's going on now. This is this is the crime. I mean, the disappearance of of parts of London. The 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 the, the exploitation of. I mean, it starts in a doss house with the with the super poor. The the displace the people who sleep in the bushes that's what's in the bushes so absolutely you know Antonio which is the photographer also exploits going there he posing, documents and he posing, exploits yeah yeah, yeah. so the, the photographer <laughs> actually is the criminal yes yeah yeah sure I mean sure the, the, the camera and the gun and the and you know I mean I think Friedrich Kittler points out that the, the people who the same Manufacturers of cameras were also gun manufacturers, and especially of moving cameras. You know, you're you're you're, you're putting images for and of typewriters. The Royal Typewriter Company also made machine guns and Remington. So sure, yeah, yeah. But there's always a crime. There's always a crime. Always, <laughs> even if it's not the one you think it is. But I think yeah, the photographer is a criminal. 
to some extent. Uh, but also in the film, uh, Thomas is first absolutely confident about his identity. So, what are you doing? Well, I'm a photographer. What else can I do but take pictures of whatever I want? And, and I think gradually, I think this confidence uh, erodes itself. Uh, and, and it comes, uh, is, is, I don't know, there's this drifting that's typical of so many Antonio Antonioni films, where, where what is seen as a safe identity uh, gradually dissolves. And I, I think I can see it in many of his films. And often ends with death, in a way, like in Zabriskie Point. Which also has a massive blow up in it. So it has it a has, <laughs> yes. wonderful everything, different blow up. Different blow up. Yeah. Yes. So, oh, hey, Luke. Hey. Um, <coughs> my, my question is quite a simple one, and, and just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about your inclusion of Mei Fu. Of what? Of Mei Fu. Oh, Le Maître right. Fou, yeah. Um, because in that film, like, the, um, the encounter with Anava is, like, so fundamentally not a kind of phenomenological thunder, thunderclap, right? Um, because the encounter with the other in that film um, is this kind of self-reflexive moment of, you know, looking at the regime itself or looking at the machine itself. And so I'm just wondering if you can talk a little bit more about the placement of that film within your lecture. Yeah. It has a kind of different tenor. Yeah. If you, I, I mean, it, it doesn't correspond one to one, but in that, in that kind of comparison, the, the Africans are not like the murder victim. They're like the models. They're being lined up, paraded, made to perform for the camera. But, but then if we draw back the lens a bit, there is a kind of subversion. That's one aspect of it. You know, they think they're stealing the, 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 the British, kind of their mojo, stealing their magic. But they're also parodying it. They're making, they're debasing it. They're making it ridiculous. It's, it becomes base. Um, sure, so, so, so that, but sure, in, in the Levinasian sense, the Africans are not an other. In, in that they're, they're very much part of a kind of machinery of power and spectacle. But I just, you know, the, the, the role that trance plays, I just think it's amazing. He tells them, shut your eyes, the models, just dream, shut your eyes. And then, and then all these people being lined up are in a kind of trance-like state. I didn't know you were here. Maybe you could answer that last question about the relationship between the still image and the moving image and the digital <laughs> and the analog. I mean, through, through, you know, that you're, you're, I think all these things are very much a, at play in in um in in your uh, uh the, the which the, that piece you know the diamond reynolds piece which you call a machine right you call it something what's the type something machine oh. has the word machine like maybe over a beer afterwards <laughs> okay <laughs> yeah <laughs> um yeah i to me, the, the word that keeps recurring is desire. Mm -hmm. It's this character who uses a camera as a, an excuse to express desire as a machine to mm -hmm. greedily capture beautiful women and objectify yeah. them and use it as an engine of commerce, all these different sy systems. I wonder if I'll just throw that out to you as a general question. Yeah, totally. It's the desiring machine. I mean, absolutely. And... and um, I mean, it's his desire, you know, when he's, when he's doing his first photo shoot, it's basically a, a sex scene, but with the camera as a, as a proxy. I mean, he, you know, it's, it's blatantly played as a, as a sexual encounter. Um, but in a bigger sense, the whole, yeah, the whole film is about the, the, the spectacular nature of, of desire. It's, you know, it's kind of very Lacanian. It's about the economy of the gaze and the, the, the loop of, of, you know, the subject is formed through this kind of desire which travels along optical lines and the whole the whole space is a kind of des desiring desiring space but with as in Lacan you know the thing that would sate that desire is is missing <laughs> and, <laughs> so. and the unintended consequences of that I mean he didn't set out to record a murder or anything like that he no. set out to photograph presumably a beautiful woman or an odd sort of scenario that was unfolding yeah, and even when he thinks he has photographed a murder, and that becomes the story, then it's not anymore. <laughs> you know, the actual, 
um, the object is is always always elusive. I mean, it's it's structurally not there, which is for Lacan though. That's the that's the basic setup. That's the deal with desire. Yeah, totally. Uh, thank you so much for that. It was really inspiring as ever. Um, I have a question. I'm not sure it's properly formulated yet, so I'm just going to kind of throw it out there. But I wonder whether a lot of the examples you've talked about in relation to this idea of mimicry and cannibalism, I wonder whether that applies to forensic architecture in the same way, because I feel like there's a slightly different logic mm -hmm. operating there. And I don't know if regurgitation is the right word, but it's kind of, it's, it's working somehow, rather than a kind of black hole of the image kind of consumed into some kind of apocalyptic, uh, you know, database that no one can, you know, it, it seems to be rescuing it yeah. from its ontological um, instability to actually try and, I don't know, that's why I use the word regurgitate, or kind of give it some other status which it risks losing at this moment. And and I suppose the other thing I was wondering is about the singular versus the multiple. So like you have the single photographer going and capturing and talking about desire, whereas if you have the image data complex where you have multiple voices constructing an event rather than the one person. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know. So anyway, I'm just th throwing that out there. I haven't thought it through properly, but it feels like there's something slightly different happening. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, with forensic architecture, I mean, it's not Levinasian in that sense. For Levinas, ethics doesn't end up in a court of law. Whereas for forensic architecture, it, it does. I mean, it, it, the, the ultimately, there is a kind of rational, juridical, co, you know, civic endpoint, and the gallery is part of that. But so is so is the courtroom, um, and there is a kind of fixed truth, like either this event happened or it didn't, you know, um, and and in in. Um, in the film, that, that you, you're right, it's, it's not the same. It is a black hole. It's, it's, uh, it's a vertiginous... Um, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, does that, does that make sense? What was the second bit? <laughs> um, it was, um, around a kind of multiplicity of, of perspectives. So y mm. you have the... Is it called the data image complex? You know, where you know lots of people are snapping the same event on their iPhone, and then you're constructing this kind of 3D, yeah. um, you know, vertiginous in other ways. But you know, it's not the it's not the one person desiring the one image in that way. I I, I feel like again something else is it's it's being manifested the other mm. way around. Yeah. Yeah, sure. De forensic architecture is Deleuzean, it's not Levinasian. It's about assemblages, multiplicities, strata, swarms, clusters, all that beautiful Deleuze stuff. It's like applied Deleuze. Um, yeah. That, I mean... <laughs> yeah? Whereas for Roberto Michel, what photography requires is a good eye and steady fingers. Mm. The importance of the fingers is uh, <laughs> being uh, accentuated. The just, digits. Just as Dali does as well. Uh, a light pressure of the fingertips. Uh, so it's a tactile uh, experience mm -hmm. as much as a visual one. Which is quite different. I don't know. I would make it different from perhaps the regime of images now. It's more a singular, a bit more aristocratic moment, I think, mm. the, the photographer, the educated sure. photographer of the 1950s yeah. or 60s. Well, the idea that, you know, you, yeah. you press a button, I mean, this is the, I mean, you know, th this is what, excuse the self-reference, but like in my last novel, the hero, anti-hero is an anthropologist who sets out to right the world the tribe, which is us, contemporary, late capitalist you know, society. And then he quickly comes to realize that, you know, the world is writing itself. This was, um, you know, Michel de Certo's point in the practice of everyday life. You actually, you don't need an anthropologist. I mean, the world is the constituent, this is what David Foster Wallace says as well in The Pale King, you know, the constituent data of the world is auto-generative. It, it, it scripts itself and it reads itself. 
you know, it's not, it's not the anthropologist that maps networks of kinships. It's like Facebook and Amazon, you know. <laughs> Every time you go online, you're being cross-indexed and tabulated with, you know, all your networks so that, so that you know, capitalism can eat you <laughs> again and again and again. And um, that's, the, w w which is fascinating in terms of the question then of, of agency. You know, what, what, what is the writer or the artist or the anthropologist there for you know that kind of heroic um rather macho kind of version of the artist you know this is a kind of 19th century thing and it, it just doesn't persist anymore and then you know how, how do we reimagine what 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 are, what are you doing when you make art i mean are, are you sliding around in this kind of i mean i was very intrigued by figures like de boer but also kathy acker william burroughs you know the idea of you know, hacking or or, or or reading the idea. You know, Theseus in the labyrinth, just just measuring and mapping. You know, you're not generating the event field. You're you're somehow in this secondary space of of, of navigating, mapping, laying bare the kind of um, network of of the symbolic and of and of the political. I mean, this is you know, Trevor Paglin would be a, again a great example of this in in the kind of w with his work. Um, and, and many contemporary artists, others we could think of. So, so yeah, again, this, this film and this book is, is kind of interesting because per perhaps it charts the moment of the downfall of that heroic, masculine, you know, macho, um, avenging hero figure. It's, it's just not, by the end of the film, it's just not a possibility. He's gone, he's been erased. There's just the grass and the, and the camouflage. Yes, and Miguel goes psychotic, as you say. And he goes psychotic, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we've got time for one more question. And sexual politics, and he's, he he doesn't have a personality. He's just moving the pieces around. And I think um, you don't talk about the sexual politics. You don't talk about the position. But maybe that's not where you're coming from for this particular lecture. It was very interesting, by the way. Um, I think that's not really a question, is it? No, it's just a no. But the sexual politics are self-evident. They're they're ob obscene. I mean, they're grotesque. Yes. I mean, yeah. <laughs> and he's not a personality. I think he's bored. He's mo he's moving the people. He's mm. controlling everything. He's he, but he's lost. And he, I, I think this is just my thing that he creates this imaginary and the mimicry mm. is setting that scene, beginning and end, for his imag the imaginary scenario that then transpires. Does that? Yeah. Say anything. No, no, I mean, sure, yeah, that, that's yeah. absolutely true, but, but he's exemplary, because London is, is like that, he's just a, he's a, he's a uh, personification of, of the London of this film, which is also bored, um, drifting from one, you know, event to the next, yes, yeah, no, the sexual politics are, I mean, absolutely, women are totally objectified, um, Although the Vanessa Redgrave character is kind of interesting, she's an agent. I mean, she's she's the orchestrator of, of the murder. I mean, she leads the man in. She she goes and gets the photos. I mean, she's quite she's certainly a powerful. And then she offers her body to get them back. Yeah, but it doesn't work. <laughs> she <can> <laughs> she, destroys <the> <laughs> she destroys the evidence apart from the 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 one. Yeah, but but the, still, there's no body. Um, yeah, bodies, bodies and bodies. I mean, she, yeah, absolutely. He doesn't get her body and he doesn't get the body that she's protecting, which is the body, the body. I mean, sure, I, I would, you know, I haven't read, there must be a huge amount of critical literature on this film and I'd imagine there are, well, if there isn't, there should be some very good feminist readings of it because it's, you know, it's, it's yeah. But I think you write about boredom and also boredom is, uh, is linked to time. Yeah. Uh, and so is photography. Well, that's what Levin, it's, it's yeah. It's the inability to deal with yeah. time. Board. The monotony of time, Levinas mm -hmm. says, a sudden consciousness of the monotony of time mm -hmm. that just 
Yeah. But also the first machine you see is, is, the, is the, the wagon in Greek, which yeah. as you know, like in Greek tragedy is used to show death. Yeah. Death is never seen, is it? It's always seen. It's always a cup in its first run, and it's caught on it. Right. Off stage, so yeah, the off the scene. Nature of that the car arriving, that that's the foreshadows of the off scene, you know, which in turn, like these, these other events unfold. So the sort of singularity of, of him through the, the singular lens yeah. sort of reflects mm. that perhaps. And on the demise, the allegory or only, you know, you can never see your death or your demise. This is true. Equally so with a society that just acts, you know, in a moral panic. Yeah, no, totally. But that's why I thought of Hamlet. I mean, the arrival of the players in Elsinore is, is super interesting because, you know, Hamlet has one thing to do in that play, kill the king. Really simple. That's all he has to do, and he doesn't do it. But, but what does totally bring down the political order is when he gets the players to reenact the death of his father, which is the unspoken of the polis, right? That's the great answer. Everyone knows it, but no one's allowed to say it. And when it's when it's replayed in this ritualized, for, you know, Hamlet rewrites this play and makes them play it in court, which blatantly allegorizes the, the murder of his, of his father. And there's a suggestion that the Elizabethan audience would have blatantly seen a replay of the murder of King James's father, you know, the current king. And so there's this staggering of, of, of replays of replays. Um, but it's, it's interesting that it's, that's the political moment, not, not the not the killing of the king, but, but the kind of, um, I mean, I suppose you could fit that into a quite conventional schema of, you know, political theater is there to speak truth to power. But I think it's actually, it's, it's more interesting than that. It's something about um, simulacrum, replay, reenactment. In Julius Caesar, similar setup, you know, Brutus is about to kill, well, he's going to kill Caesar. And then he does this amazing speech where he says, between deciding to do it and doing it, all the interim it's like a phantasmal or a hideous dream. And the state of man, like to a little kingdom, suffers then the nature of an insurrection, a revolution, which is astonishing. He's about to kill the king, but that's not the revolutionary event. It's the interval, the, the, the pause, the gap itself that is insurrectionary, that brings a whole kind of ontological kind of crisis. I mean, this is the kind of Baduan scheme, right? The event arises from the aporia, not from the actual where it's meant to come from. It's always, you know, it's always in the margins. But um, yeah. yeah, it's Greek, it's totally Greek, totally Greek Greek film. <laughs> <laughs> this is the place where, where, where it begins, this uh, plaza, which is the economist plaza. Is this that what it is? I thought I recognized it. Yeah, 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 it's the forum, it's, isn't it? It's the it's civic forum, space of... But also, it's a key. It's a key building at the time. It, it must have been super new, uh, built by the Smithson, I think. Ah, there you go. So I don't know. It's, yeah. it's really chosen very carefully, I think. And the forum is a place yeah. where trade and yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, Greek. Great audience. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you, Tom and Olivier. Thank you.